Hello everybody! Today is kind of a big day for me because today I would like to give you an introduction to one of my favorite authors who wrote some of my favorite books of all time and who I think to this day is or was the best writer of historical fiction set in antiquity that has ever written. One of her books was even shortlisted for the Booker Prize in 1970, although I do think they could have picked a better book for that. I'm talking about Mary Reynold, who wrote eight novels set in the ancient Greek world, including Alexander the Great's extension of it. Mary Reynold was born in England in 1905, but emigrated to South Africa in the 1940s. She had a degree in English literature, but not in classics or ancient history, although you wouldn't think so, judging by the novels that she wrote, which are all incredibly well researched, rich in detail, and you can tell that they were written by somebody who has a very firm grasp of the culture of the time and of the characters and the way that they would have talked and thought. Mary Reynolds was a lesbian or bisexual maybe. In any case, she was in a lifelong relationship with a woman and most, if not all, of her novels that are set in a contemporary setting are about queer characters or queer issues. And most of her novels that are set in antiquity contain gay characters and themes as well, which apparently led to the rumor in Mary Reynolds' lifetime that she was really a gay man writing under pen name to further the gay agenda or something. It's funny because in most of her historical novels the gay themes aren't even particularly pronounced if compared to the source material. My favorite book of Mary Reynolds unexpectedly turned out to be one of the contemporary novels, the only one of those that I have read, and that is The Charioteer, but that is a book for another day. Today I would like to talk only about the historical novels. Of those eight historical novels, I have read seven. The one I haven't read is The Bull from the Sea, which is the second of the two Theseus myth retellings. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but Eva, Theseus wasn't a historical person, you know. But bear with me here. I'm going to talk about the remaining seven books in the order from my least favorite to my favorite and give you a brief introduction to them. And then afterwards I would like to talk about some general aspects of Mary Reynolds' writing that I like. In the last place we have The King Must Die, which is a retelling of the Theseus myth right up to and including the rescue of the Athenian youth who were given as a tribute to King Minos of Crete which is, in the original myth, the fight against the Minotaur. This book tells the childhood of Theseus in Troisene on the Peloponnesus and of his journey to Athens, where Theseus intends to be recognized as the heir apparent of his father, King Aegeus of Athens. It is a sort of demythified version of the original myth without monsters and to a large degree without gods, although the gods are talking to Theseus. But well, there are people like that. The book is at once an origin story to the myth and an interpretation of the myth. When I rank this book last, it is by no means to say that this is a bad book, just that I didn't enjoy it as much as the others, mostly because the Greek heroes have never been my favorites, and the book is a rather by-the-book retelling of the myth, which means if you are familiar with the myth, you always know what's coming next, and if you are not that interested in Theseus in the first place, it, it gets a bit tedious, but if you are, then this is the book for you. Next up is the Alexander Trilogy, Fire from Heaven, The Persian Boy, and Funeral Games. Fire from Heaven is the story of Alexander's youth right up to his ascension as the King of Macedon in 336 BCE. It is about the court politics of the time, most prominently about the conflicts that arose because Queen Olympias, Alexander's mother, didn't intend to lose influence to any of the wives that King Philip took after her. It is also about Alexander's education, most importantly about his very influential time with Aristotle. 
but at the center of the narrative are the relationships between Alexander and the Hitairoi, the sons of the members of the Macedonian court or the Macedonian chieftains who traditionally became the entourage of the Macedonian prince. In Alexander's case, they would later become his generals and after his death, most of them would become his successors and would divide his conquered territory among them. But this book stops before the beginning of Alexander's campaign against the Persian Empire. The Persian Boy is an account of the campaign of Alexander told from the perspective of Baguas, a um, slave and eunuch in the service of the Persian great king whom Alexander picked up in Susa, the um, biggest and most important of the Persian residential cities. There, Bagoas had been in the service of the Persian great king, but was left behind there with all the other non-fighting members of the Persian court when King Darius was defeated at the Battle of Gaugamela in 331 BCE and fled and was soon after murdered. That was only the beginning of Alexander the Great's campaign to conquer the whole world, or at the very least the Persian Empire, and the rest of it is told from the perspective of Bagoas, who spares us tedious battle scenes and diplomatic talk, but provides some nice commentary instead. Funeral Games takes place after the death of Alexander and tells the story of what happened to Alexander's conquered territories. It technically spans 15 years from Alexander's death in 324 BCE to 310 BCE, but the bulk of the story takes place in just a few months after Alexander's death when it was still a possibility that the whole of his conquered territories might go to one person and become one huge empire. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell the whole tale of the wars of the Diadochi, the heirs of Alexander, and the ever-shifting allegiances and alliances of this time, which I would have liked because it would have helped me memorize <laughs> the, the um, confusing events of this time. But instead, it is mostly about the exasperating court scribbles and, and intrigues at the courts in Macedon and Susa and Babylon, which I don't find that interesting, I have to say, and this book is a big reason why I rank this trilogy so low as a whole. Another big reason is that I think the criticism of Alexander could have been a bit more pronounced. It only arises here and there when, uh, in The Persian Boy, when Bagoas laments the sack of Persepolis, for instance, or when he mentions that it might be a tad distasteful that Alexander's army terrorizes the rural population all the time by pillaging and raping their way through the country. But oh well, back to the last story. The first book in particular is one big romanticization of the boy Alexander, and I do think we romanticize and humanize these mass-murdering egomaniacs a, a little too much as it is. The Last of the Wine is a wonderful book that is set during the time of the Great Peloponnesian War of the Athenian Empire against Sparta in the late 5th century BCE. And it is the story of two young Athenian noblemen and how they come into their own personality-wise. Through an education that is a bit unconventional, as they are both followers of Socrates, as you will know, Socrates was ultimately convicted of corrupting the Athenian youth and was executed for it. But of course, it is also the war that changes these two young men. First, its repercussions in Athens and their daily lives, but then immediately when they have to fight in it. The story culminates in the inner conflict that arose in Athens as a consequence of the war when an oligarchic regime took over power in Athens and a large portion of the citizenship left the city to rally and form an opposition in the harbour town. And friends sometimes found themselves on opposite sides. I love this book a whole lot. Although there is still a lot of romanticization going on, it paints a very complicated and ambivalent picture of Athens. The story is told from the perspective of one of the two young men, Alexias, who tells his story as an old man looking back on his youth. And 
The book has a wonderful feeling of nostalgia to it. It is still only my third favorite book though. My second favorite is The Praise Singer. This is about the life and times of the poet Simonides who lived from the middle of the 6th century to the middle of the 5th century BCE. And as such he witnessed key events in the late archaic period. The book is not so much about the person and poetry of Simonides as it, it uses him, the wandering singer, as the point of view from which to look at these key events of the late archaic period and the conditions in the different cities and regions that he visited. So we get to see late archaic Athens and the fall of the tyrants there and we get to see how the Persian great king brought the eastern, eastern Greek cities under his control and it is also very much about the culture of the time in general. Although a lot of the events that happen are quite dramatic, this is a very quiet and reflective book as because Simonides was never a key player in these events. He is mostly just an onlooker. He didn't wield the knife that killed the tyrants and he wasn't executed at the stake by the Persian great king as some of his friends were. I like this novel a whole lot, especially since it deals with events and historical persons that aren't usually the focus of books or films that are set in antiquity, so it feels fresh and like something that I was lacking. But my very favorite historical novel of Mary Reynolds came as a surprise to me. It is The Mask of Apollo. This is on its face a, a look at Greek theatre as the protagonist and narrator Nikeratos is an actor. But as in the case of the praise singer, he is used as the point of view from which to a paint a picture of the culture of his time and b to tell the political history from the point of view of somebody who is a bystander and only indirectly involved in political events. The story is set in Sicily in the palace of Syracuse in the first half of the 4th century BCE and it is the somewhat tragic story of Dion who was a great friend of Plato's and the subject of Plato's very famous seventh letter whose Authenticity, I think, has finally been agreed upon by modern scholars. Dion was, as a Syracusan nobleman, opposed to the dynasty of tyrants there, who had been ruling for some time, and in the end he managed to overthrow the reigning tyrant Dionysius II, and he took over power himself, either to rule or to oversee a political transformation of the city. And there the tragedy begins. Dion seems to have been Plato's great hope for the establishing of Plato's um, perfect state which he lays out in the dialogue Politeia. And that is an enlightened and humanitarian system in which the philosophers, meaning the thinkers and scholars, are the ruling class. But of course in the end it didn't work out the way that Plato and it seems everybody else including Dion had hoped and Dion refuses to relinquish power and becomes a despotic tyrant himself. The book's protagonist is Dion's protege as an actor and he witnesses his success and his inevitable tragic downfall. And there is a certain irony to his being an actor because actors or the theatre in general were the enemy in Plato's eyes because he viewed the myth that they reenacted as reactionist and objectionable moral codes that Plato wished the people would stop following blindly. Which I guess is largely justified because you have to keep in mind that all the great plays, the great tragedies that we know today, the ones of Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides, were regarded as subversive or outright scandalous at the time, so they are not representative of what Plato objected to. The horrific bro culture of Homer is, and I guess we can all agree that this is something to be avoided. Anyhow, it was this irony and the fascinating and timeless tragedy of a leader who means well but inevitably becomes corrupted by power that I loved so much about this book. 
even though its main character is the least memorable of them all. <laughs> all of these books, even the ones that I have ranked lowest, are incredibly engaging and engrossing. And what makes them so is certainly, to a large degree, the beautiful prose. Most of these books are told from the point of view of an older narrator who looks back on his life as a younger person. And Mary Reynolds' prose conveys a very powerful feeling of bittersweet nostalgia. But the best and most engaging characteristic of these novels is how realistic they are. Mary Reynolds' characters don't feel like modern persons who were somehow transported into ancient times. They feel and read like they are of their time. That means that in many instances the way that they talk and that they think is quite alien to us, which is as it should be when we are talking about ancient Athenians. But it is also the writing style that is very realistic, especially when it comes to dialogue. Mary Reynolds has her characters talk to each other in a very realistic way, meaning that they don't explain things to each other that would have been self-evident to them and they often reference people and events only in with the barest of words, especially if those events are of a delicate nature. I vividly remember having to read a paragraph in Fire from Heaven three times and wreck my head because I had no clue at first what the characters were talking about until I realized, ah, of course, they are referencing the Battle of Crocus Field, <laughs> naturally. And that was at a time when I was very much an expert in these things. So, you see, Mary Reynolds writes for an audience who has the same background of classical education that she had as a person of her time. That might sound daunting, but I don't think it has to put anybody off reading these novels. Just think about it as of reading a novel that is set in a different country and written by somebody from that country who wouldn't necessarily explain every bit of background knowledge to you. But still, the reading experience doesn't have to be completely frustrating. On the contrary, it, it can be incredibly enjoyable to read something that is set in a, in a world that is completely different to you, written by somebody who clearly has a very deep as well as broad understanding of this world. It isn't every day that you come across an author who writes books set in antiquity, who has such a firm knowledge of what they are writing about. Couple that with beautiful prose and you get some of the best novels in the world, in my opinion. If you're asking where should I start with Mary Reynolds books, what's a good place to start if I don't have that much background knowledge, I'd recommend that you start with either the Alexander books either Fire from Heaven or The Persian Boy, which can both be read as standalones, or The Mask of Apollo. I wouldn't recommend that you start with a praise singer, and particularly not with The Last of the Wine, because these two are very dense, and I think The Last of the Wine in particular requires some background knowledge to be really enjoyable. Although, it isn't always easy to tell how much background knowledge a reader would need in order to enjoy a book. I can only hope that at some point in the future you will pick up any of her books at all, if you haven't already done so. Because like I said, in my opinion, she is the best writer of historical fiction set in antiquity that has ever written. I'm going to talk about my second favorite one in an upcoming video. Until then, I hope you are having a nice day and I'll see you very soon with another video. Bye!